Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 2019 release, Blood and Flesh, The Real Life and Ghastly Death of Al Adamson. That's a long title, and that's one of the big things, well, not a big thing, but that's one of the small things I kind of want to throw out there is this film's done by David Gregory, written and directed by David Gregory. He's done some other, well, a bunch of other uh, documentaries, some that I've seen, well, one in particular I've seen and others that I definitely want to see. But one of the things this, that guy needs to work on is shaving down the titles of his documentaries. It's just so long and so unnecessary. Um, you could even just cut blood and flesh off of this. Just the real life and ghastly death of Al Adamson. Just like cut it down. It's a lot. People are not going to remember these names. Got to make them short and sweet. But anyway, that's just a small thing for me. Now, I'm not doing spoilers for this review since it's a 2019 release and it just hit Shudder. I would definitely recommend people checking it out. Especially if you've seen another documentary of David Gregory's that's on Shutter right now. And if you haven't seen it, also see that. Uh, also has a long title. Uh, it's called Lost Soul, the... If I can remember it exactly. Lost Soul, the Doomed Journey of Richard Stanley's Island of Dr. Moreau. Very interesting. Uh, the guy knows how to put together a documentary very well. So anyway, other films that he's done. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Shocking Truth. The Joe Spinell Story, The Godfathers of Mondo, Ban the Sadist Videos, Forget Everything You Have Ever Seen, The World of Santa, Santa Sangre, What's in the Basket, Master of Dark Shadows, and then Lost Soul, The Doom Journey of Richard Stanley's Island of Dr. Moreau. Now, if anyone's interested in having a physical copy of this Al Adamson documentary, it is available through Severin Films, so go there. Uh, unfortunately, they had like a special edition, I think they only had like 2,000 copies of it, where you got the documentary, but then you got actually a bunch of old Al Adamson films as well, which I would have loved to get my hands on that, but I was too late when I found out about it. So kind of a quick synopsis, um, I mean obviously it's a documentary about a guy named Al Adamson who made a lot of film throughout decades, uh, going back to, I think he started in the 60s. Definitely 70s, potentially 60s, but rewatch it and it, it kind of charts. The documentary charts his entire career. It starts with his death, which is what most people kind of know about him uh, because it was in t in the tabloids, basically. It was, it was a headline situation with him being murdered. And so, you know, that's one of those salacious things. So a lot of people probably didn't even know what he did for a living and how much of an impact he had on film industry so it's great for these documentaries to come out because it can give people the ability to know more about this person it's very sad when the only thing that it's known about someone is that they were murdered and in what manner it happened like a crazy story like that there's a person behind that and this documentary goes the distance to tell about this person and one of the great things and the reason that it really plays out well is a lot of people who worked with Al Adamson throughout his life are interviewed for this, like a good amount, and it's great because you hear these personal stories, um, not just about how great of a person Al Adamson was, because a lot of people said that, or pretty much everyone, but also like their personal stories about stuff that went on during you know filming of some of these films. So it's it's very engaging. It's probably I think it's like an hour and forty. No, I think it's like an hour, an hour and a half. It's like an hour and thirty some minutes, I think. But it's um, it's good. It's definitely well worth it. It leads with the shocking headline. Uh, that's kind of a that attention grabber, and it, like I said, it's what probably most people know about Al Adamson about his shocking death. Um, and then it moves over to you know people speaking well of Al, and then it starts opening up about his career, giving the backstory of you know the family he was born into, how he got interest in film, and it's. It's a great mapping of his entire life, and especially his life having to do with film, and I love it. Uh, they then backtrack, uh, or I said that. the pace of mixing the interviews with film clips is done really, really well. <clears throat> Excuse me, is done well, and it keeps the film moving at a really nice pace. Uh, and it's impressive, like I was saying, how many people they were able to pull in for this film, especially people who are close with Al. And I think that kind of speaks to who Al probably was as a person, because if that many people are willing to, you know, go on film and talk about you, most likely they're excited about that. Like they want to do you justice. 
So, because no one really says anything bad about him in this. For the most part. There, there are a few things that kind of allude to maybe some stuff, but a lot of people who worked closely with Al end up being interviewed, which, which makes the storytelling feel more intimate. That's something I didn't kind of um, touch on when I was talking about the great firsthand stories. The intimacy aspect of people who knew him is a great touch to the documentary. Uh, they use interview clips of Al, um, older interview clips before he died, which I think is really great because it's good to kind of hear from him. But it's also a little bit weird because you know what ends up happening to him. So it's kind of odd to actually hear directly from him because it's a documentary about him and it's, you know what happens in the end. So it's pretty, yeah. That's always like in your mind when he's, you know, talking in the interviews. But it's good to hear stuff directly from his mouth. The stories of how low budget and fast the productions were are really, really cool. And you kind of understand how hardworking everyone who was working on these films actually were. I think they had said that a lot of the, the productions were 10 days or less, which is pretty insane. I mean, I've done um, short films years ago, and I mean, I've, I've done like those 48-hour film project things, but I can't imagine doing like a feature-length film in like 10 days or less. That's insane. And everything was like shoestring budget. Everything was kind of weird. The scripts weren't that great and actually one of the big things they would do is they would adapt scripts basically to you know how they could best market or sell that film at that time period they kind of went for all like the exploitation stuff you know they went through like the motorcycle portion the black exploitation portion you know horror like all these things so they just keep you know adapting which you know it's smart because that's how you stay a lot or uh, stay alive in the film industry you know you have to you know, make that happen, especially if you're like Al Adamson and the people he was working with in that you were playing directly to the drive-in theaters mainly, that kind of grindhouse drive-in crowd, and they 100% were. You know, these weren't great films, and a lot of people say that in the documentary, but they were interesting films, and the, the marketing campaigns were good enough, and the subjects were good enough, and the films were just good enough that it would bring people in to actually make money. They could get these things sold. Now, one, one of the interesting things, too, is that they would sometimes take the exact same film, rename it, change the marketing campaign, and then release it. So, I mean, I know, okay, so this is making me think, I know I said, like, no spoilers, but, I mean, there's a lot to this documentary, so I apologize. But uh, that's one of the things that struck me as being particularly crazy, is they, they would remarket these same films but just change the titles and, and the marketing campaign stuff. So it's interesting. And when you hear that or when I hear that, at first my initial reaction is, uh, that's very dishonest, that's kind of crappy. But then I'm like, but you're probably drawing a different crowd though. So I guess it's kind of okay. And especially because these guys were doing it so low budget, they were so independent. Um, you know, if people wanted to see it, I'm sure there were people who had seen it in a different iteration, they go and see it and they're like, wait a minute, I've seen this before. This is just like this one. Uh, but I'm sure there were plenty of people that that was not the case. So they were seeing it for the first time. How do you get films in front of as many eyes as possible? And that's one of the ways. Um, the films often had extra scenes inserted when they realized things didn't actually make sense or when they needed to pivot to the different material to, you know, hit that broader audience. That's one of the interesting things that they talk about in depth that I found fun is talking about those examples of, you know, we did our 10 or less days shooting of this and then we realized, um, you know, we're missing some stuff. Part of the story doesn't make any sense. So we went back and we inserted this and we inserted that. And sometimes it ends up changing the whole story of the film or it ends up making things so convoluted that the film just doesn't even make sense anymore or it's not even what it was initially supposed to be. And those are the cool stories in this documentary, for me personally. I love hearing that type of stuff. And then just the, the personal stories about this is what was going on on set, this is what this person's personality was like. I love those types of things. And David Gregory lays it out in a very good way. The charting of Adamson's films through time uh, reflects the changes in popularity of different types of films. Because Adamson, you know, was playing to that. So it's cool while the documentary is going on to realize that when they're citing these time periods and what films Al Adamson was making, 
that's what was popular in film at that point. So you really can kind of like chart the popularity of what types of films during those, those time periods based off his, his films, which I thought were cool. Um, he also was very well known for stretching a buck. Uh, people said all the time he was very frugal with making his films, hence, you know, such a quick production period. Um, but there was something kind of talked about a few times. They did not dive deep into it, and I think it's because they just wanted to talk in a favorable light only about Al, and that is that he wasn't really paying people. He was kind of just getting people to come and work with him, and from what you can tell from the documentary, these people were working hard. You know, they, they weren't just doing crew or doing acting. A lot of these people were doing both of those things. But these people, even though they weren't really getting paid, always were saying they had a great time. They kept going back and, and uh, working with Al again because they liked him so much. But one of the things that occurred to me is that it seems like he was doing just fine financially, but other people kind of weren't being included in that. So I think that's kind of a part that maybe they should have gone down that road a little bit more just to explain, you know, is, you know, what's what's the validity behind some of these comments that are made like was he actually not really paying people and he really should have been like was he very wealthy at, at any point and he should have been sharing more of that money or is it a situation where you know these people were just kind of saying that and he actually was paying people i don't know but that was one of the negative things that i kind of pulled out of it uh the end of the film is kind of the more serious portion which brings you back down so it's, it's kind of this emotional roller coaster in a way where you start with like that attention grab of the salacious headlines and you're just like, oh, that's terrible. And then it, it get quickly goes to a lighter situation where, you know, people are talking about Al in such a good way. And then you learn his backstory and you learn about his filmography a bit. And then it, it's all fun. and it's, it's super fun. And then all of a sudden they kind of circle back around to what they started with and the mood comes way down. It gets very serious, it comes way down, and it almost plays a little bit like some of these crime documentaries out there. And it's done well, and if you're into that, you should also be into this. So it, it's 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 well done, but be prepared for that kind of emotional roller coaster to a degree. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to say is just about all the films covered seem like they could be pretty popular now as those so bad it's good films so while they were coming out people were you know recognized them as not great films but i think people should really be hitting these al adamson films a lot if they aren't already i didn't really look i'm i, I know some of them i've seen available here and there but yeah people should really be going after these al adamson films especially after the release of this documentary to try and get them out there and make money because now is definitely the era of old films coming back and being popular because they're so bad that they're good and from what i see in this documentary these al adamson films are those films uh and i mean my interest is severely peaked with this and i really want to check out some of this stuff so uh yeah so that's all i have to say about the documentary definitely watch it i really liked it so out of five stars with half stars in play i'm gonna give it a four star rating very very solid very good and like I said, if you also haven't seen the Doctor uh, Island of Dr. Moreau documentary, it is, I think it's still on Shudder at this time. So you could even do a double feature, the Al Adamson one, the Richard Stanley one. That'd be a good one. Uh, I will give you a warning, though. Listening to Richard Stanley be interviewed is a little bit tough at times because he's very monotone and he runs a lot of his sentences to get up together. So it's kind of ends up being a little bit like being in a lecture hall in college. <laughs> You get a little bit sleepy, but pay attention. There's some interesting stuff in there. But anyway, uh, love to hear your comments. If you've seen this documentary or if you're excited to see it, put the comments down there. We can definitely go deep in the spoilers in the comments. That's fine with me. Uh, do me a quick favor, though. Hit that subscribe button if you like this video or any video I've ever done. That is the best way to repay me, and I really appreciate that. So, um, yeah, that would be wonderful. Also, hit the uh, notification bell because then you'll know whenever I'm putting up any new video or doing a live stream or anything like that. But regardless, thanks for taking your time to watch this. And until next time, keep it brutal.